Well, hello everyone, good evening. Thank you for coming and staying this late, as Milena said. Um, We're coming from Crater Studio, and today uh, my colleagues and our special guest star, Scott Anderson, will have a say about creatures that we did um, over the years and something that we are passionate about. Uh, my name is Cassandra, and I'm a production manager in the studio. Uh, Bogdan, our oral FX, VFX guy. Uh, Peter, you may know, uh, owner of the studio. And Scott Anderson, our very, very special guest star, coming from LA, that we worked over many projects um, together. So, let's begin. <laughs> A couple of months ago, we did uh, some tests for the for the actual bear uh, running, and uh, we did this uh, in uh, Maya and Xgen, and we did snow in Houdini with Vellum, and for the character uh, rigging, let me just okay next one. Yeah, for the character rigging, we used uh, Ziva plugin. So it was, uh, it was our second time of using this uh, system. It's really great. Okay. 
and this is, for example, how uh, how fur simulation looks. Uh, we actually simulated fur with Houdini and then transferred these curves to Maya for uh, hair generation. And the great thing about uh, Vellum, it is really fast. So we had uh, like uh, one hour simulations for, for these uh, 20K uh, hair guides. So uh, then this is uh, what we have uh, when we multiply the number of hairs. So this is around 2 million. In the end, we had around 5 million hairs and we were rendering it in Arnold and it proved very tough for this kind of job. So these are some um, simulations for the snow. So down there, you can see some wedges for the, for the snow. Uh, the good thing is that we had a break, two week, two week break in which uh, we could test different parameters for the snow. Okay. And this is the other shot we did uh, for, the, for the same test. So this one, this one was even more challenging. And yeah, we, again, we used Vellum to, to simulate this uh, first. And in the end, uh, we used Arnold, but uh, used Houdini for hair generation. So this is, for example, hair simulation for the for the mother, and this these are snow simulations. So these snow simulations are really simple. So we just measure the velocity of some snow particles and uh, set them off. Okay. So yeah, Cassandra will well, take. I will take over, but just for a second, and I will uh, give Peter a word. Uh, to say something about um, the birds that we did, and, and please tell us about why why we like doing creatures at Crater. Well, what's the challenge there? The, the challenge is mostly because it's the most difficult, and we like in Serbia to think that we are really like some big nations. We can do. We are always about competing with some who is ten times bigger than us. So we decided let's try to do the what most difficult because it's the most challenging so at the end uh, eventually we did something we couldn't fight the, 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 the with the big studios in a way that how they are good and what they could provide in a in a in, a, in a, not just the quality then in a quantity but we achieved a lot and we are so proud that we showed ourselves and, and to the world that we are really capable to do something amazing, that it's a creature performance, something that you really start to believe that this is not a CGI, just a 3D model, that, that that's something that really you feel like it's alive. Okay. So what you see, it's a peacock, and this is a... This was done in a Renderman. It was 2010. It, it's really great, uh, great movie. The other guys, you can find it on Netflix. Who watch it? So it's a comedy, uh, and it was really for us. That was a really great success to work uh, for Columbia Pictures. And to this movie was two weeks uh, first in the box office as some summer hit, uh, and. This peacock is sh showing only in one shot in the in the whole movie, but but we but we did it really with a with a effort that it, it's something that will will be shown as a as a main character in the movie. As yeah. an ongoing reference for yeah, for this is a turntable. How how we are. We even had uh, peacock feathers in the studio. As yeah. the that was our reference. first bird we that we yeah. did. And then we did a movie called On Milky Way, it's a domestic project, in which uh, we had a sequence with real eagle, so we, we needed to, to match as close as possible that real eagle. So this was more challenging because we had interaction between, uh, between the bird and the character. It, it, it should uh, tell a story about nature. So. This is, uh, this is look development that we did for that eagle. So can you tell which one is CG? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so for, for this one, uh, we, we switched to Arnold. So we were using Arnold for rendering this. It was really great project and we had uh, over, I think 10 shots of eagle. 
And then after that, or no, before that, but never mind, uh, we did the shark night in which we did a lot of uh, these kind of shark uh, effects. And uh, Marcus and Marcus really helped us with uh, both uh, Arnold and Bifrost and one great guy, Igor, uh, he did these water simulations. So without them, uh, this wouldn't be possible. And for us, this was really great ticket to, to get uh, better projects. So, yeah, for this film, we actually did uh, six sharks and we used, uh, in our shots, we used only three sharks. Uh, the other sharks we provided to, to other vendors. Okay. It's a shark shop. And as Bogdan mentioned, that was our ticket <laughs> to more films with sharks. Um, and uh, even before we went into Shallows and working with Scott, uh, we did uh, Mohammed as well. But we won't talking. We won't be talking much about that because it's not creature based. But Shallow is, and really there was a huge. Uh, it was maybe two years ago now. Um, did with under Sony Pictures, and um, it was actually a great way for creator to actually work with the other studios. Um, it was many studios were involved and in sharing, sharing the assets. So um, more about that, Scott can tell us. Sure, as, as they said, um, you know, both the Shark Knight 3D and the other guys were the ways I came to know you guys um, through another supervisor friend we have in common we had actually worked on a commercial that I went over and covered plates in uh, Spain for. And um, over the years, what you're always looking for on projects is somebody that casts well, you know, matches up talents and where people want to go with the kind of work you have. And these guys wanted to do creatures. We have creatures that needed to be done. Sometimes you need new new teams on board and we brought Crater into the fold uh, and tried some new kinds of shots. So as I said, we had a very large show with Mohammed. Part of what we were thinking about is some of the water stuff that didn't happen with them, but we brought some large scale projects, shots together where they were doing the compositing. I had a couple of vendors either doing animation, my company, Digital Sandbox, was doing some rendering, and we were putting a lot of the pieces together. So part of that is for us to build my pipeline with them to be able to hand work back and forth internationally, work with other vendors, share stuff as a larger team. And as we get to that step, you start ratcheting up what you have different members of your team do. So we jumped into you know, a shark was a gimme. They had done a shark before, so it was easy to show the client and <laughs> yeah. say, hey, they've done sharks before, they've done some water, let's bring them on to this project. Okay, uh, we will show you a show reel of Scott's company. Uh, so, in their reel, you've seen a good amount of stuff that we've done together. Uh, this is a little bit of historical reel since I'm the last ad to the program. You might not know what I've done, but here's a little ancient history for you. Like this. Like this. 
pigs are definitely stupid. <laughs> no, we're not. Good heavens. Who are you? So, um, I don't know if you can name all the movies, I can't. Um, it's been about 30 years of films. Yeah, We're going to focus <laughs> on most of the stuff we've done together tonight, but we are going to stay for questions and answers afterwards, so feel free to ask any question after. So, yeah, Shallows was a project I was brought into um, that was really a worldwide collaboration. Uh, we were designing sequences and breaking them up around the world, but really bringing the design aspect of it central to, it was a Sony Pictures film. So we had a small team on the production side that designed the environments, designed the look, and distributed that out to all the different companies working on it. Uh, Digital Sandbox, my company, did some shots in-house, and then we brought in Crater to do some of the shark shots, as well as some of the set extensions. The whole movie was shot you know, primarily on a blue screen tank. We had um, Blake Lively on a little miniature island and some water, but most of the water and most of what you see was a set extension, a simulation, and all the setups were set up and shared amongst that. Um, Import, ILP, Important Looking Pirates, did the main shark design. So unlike um, the other shark where they were giving the shark out, we were delivering the shark to our different vendors, Crater included. And the initial design of the shark itself was um, Arnold-based, so it fit right in your pipeline, and sometimes that's important when we're finding partners. But from the quick before and afters here, you get a sense of some of the scope. But what you don't see is, yeah, I don't remember how many shots you guys did for oh, us wow. on this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was uh, around 80. Okay. Um, but it all just fits in seamlessly with what we were doing. But the shark is a character in the film. You know, we're studying, you know, what you want a shark to do, what our director wanted the sharks to do, and try to balance that storytelling aspect of it with the technical aspect of it. Do you have other stuff? Yeah. Yeah, this is something we did uh, soon after. Yep. Um, it was a Netflix series, um, a series of unfortunate events. And uh, the cre creature we did for that was that leech, which was not an ordinary leech, definitely. So that was a challenge because it is a, it is a creature, but there's no real life reference for it. It's more like a Frankenstein it's something new. So he, he has the behavior of the leech, but it's exaggerated in, in many ways. So that was a fun. <laughs> and, and most uh, things in Barry's world, yes. Barry Sonnenfeld, the director, most everything in his world's exaggerated. So, so well, we, we were impressed with the nose. It, it has a pig's nose right on the head. <laughs> what says, you know, what's that about? But um, yeah, it was it was um, it was challenging projects. Definitely, it was short, very short time. I think we had I don't know maybe two and a half months. It was 200 shots to do. Uh, but I've I've done a few shows that are considered 911s, which is an emergency show. So yeah, that looks like that one. <laughs> this one they called and said, hey, we have a bunch of shots. We need to find a home. And I said, well, we can do some in-house, we can do some with Crater. And again, mixing and matching. It was also a show where over the years, you guys had grown to have a stronger mat department, 
Uh, we were mixing some of the comp stuff we had done on Muhammad with some of the creature stuff. So it's also yes. not only an evolution of the creature work, but an evolution of the flow and trust of the pipeline and us being able to pass work back and forth. So not in the real, you know, we'd have certain shots that suddenly Barry would want to sit down with us in LA and work on, and we would have these guys pass the mile files back to us in LA. We'd make adjustments with the director, and then we'd push it back to you guys. With the time difference, they would pick it up the next day in the morning. They'd work on it while we were sleeping in LA. I'd get a comp back the next morning after that, and we'd be able to show it to Barry. So we were basically not quite 24 hours a day, but pretty darn close. And at the end, I think both of us were working 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think there were 48-hour yeah, days. That's actually really true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was not an easy one. It was, yeah. um, uh, when we asked for shots, they gave us 50 more shots than we agreed to do and said, please, we just need you to try. Yeah, and, yeah we had some sleepless nights. But yes. also, I think the creator then was the, the biggest uh, People-wise, I think we had actually a problem of where to sit all these people. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't have any room, so yeah, it was crazy and good times. Yeah. Then, um, next uh, project we did, um, last year we finished, uh, was Sweetheart. Which it was came out two days ago, you can watch yeah. it on Netflix. It's out, uh, you can have a look. Yeah. I think Bogdan has a trailer What as is well the ready. shortcut for desktop on uh, Mac? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Bogdan, I think these are two simple things. Yeah, we, That's we, why you're we so couldn't uh, <laughs> put the sound on uh, that. So in case you can't tell from the trailer, uh, this is a Blumhouse film. You know, they're known for many of the thrillers and horror films, particularly low budget uh, projects. And Sweetheart was written um, by our director, J.D. Dillard, who sort of worked with J.J. Abrams, came through that and is an up and coming uh, director. Mm -hmm. An old coordinator of mine is now head of production for Blumhouse. And she called me and said, hey, this isn't a project we normally do. It's, you know, we don't do this kind of creature work. And we know it's not the kind of budget you do, but we think you'd like the director. And we'd like to get you together and see what we can do. And then they said, I asked them, well, what's the schedule? And Blumhouse, they said, well, we shoot about all our movies in 26 days. I'm like, five weeks, I can do anything for five weeks. So we started the discussion, working on the script. It took him about a year to finish the script, yeah. but I also said, hey, we have a team that can do things very cost effectively. And if we design it right and we talk about it right, um, we can find a way of doing this within the parameters that Blumhouse had for budget. Um, you know, other than some indie films or short films I made by myself, I think this is one of the lowest budget projects I've ever worked on. Uh, but we were able to get these guys involved. Um, Neville Page, who's a fairly well-known creature designer in the United States, he designed the creature for JD because they had met before. Uh, originally, when we were looking at the project, we are going to do like Panama or Mexico as a place to shoot. But uh, lucky for me, we transferred the production to Fiji. And by going to Fiji, we started to look for creature effects companies who made the physical suit and the sculpts that we would work from. So this was going to be a combination of old school man in a suit effects along with the digital effects. Very much both to keep the budget in line, but also to keep that physicality of working with a real creature 
And so we managed to get what a workshop, which is the physical department of what a digital on board. And they were excited to do it because they don't get to do much, much on <laughs> set anymore. And yeah. so the old, the um, getting an actor in a suit and getting him on board, the suit was not only a complex build, but had some animatronic action. So this isn't CG, this is old school animatronic puppeteered, but the puppeteer controls the head separately from the performer in the suit. So there's some synchronization problems that you have, much like we did many years ago when I did Babe. You know, the puppeteers have to know the eye angle and for some action stuff that wouldn't work. So we knew we could do hybrid shots. We knew we could combine the physical technology on set along with the physical interaction our actor would get. And then we'd be able to choose the shots that work and other shots that didn't quite work. We could do CG accents or blends because now our ability to match CG with these guys and the physical suit is now there as a reality. So the breathing apparatus, thinking angry apparatus, you just see some of the detail that goes into both sides of the work. Some pre-tests we we're doing for, you know, seeing what materials look like under different lighting situations on set. So this was before we were shooting, we shot some photo references, both for us from a production design on set, but also for these guys. So you see what the materials look like under firelight. What sort of fake firelight would we be using when we're lighting the set? Would that look good? Did our director like it? And once the director liked it, we sent it to these guys so that they could start copying it before mm -hmm. we were done shooting. Yes. Yeah, so uh, now this is a CG model. Yeah. <laughs> so we got a scan uh, of, the, of the character and we got a bunch of photos so we could uh, easily uh, do texturing. It's uh, the main challenge for this character was uh, because it's human-like. Uh, we used the muscle system for this also, and it had a lot of custom controls, like uh, some parts that are more li more like fish and so on. So this is a look development test for the head. So for some shots, we even blended parts of the parts of the CG uh, with the practical monster and these are some pose tests so uh, before even we got shots uh, we did these uh, pose tests and our animators uh, tried to match the reference with some uh, dolphins I think but, yeah I think I said dolphin one or two times <laughs> okay <laughs> so this is uh, one actual shot uh, so here it was challenging uh, to get character, uh, like getting into water and getting out uh, pretty fast. But yeah, it took him maybe 15 meters to get there. It doesn't look like that. So these, uh, these things are really helpful to us. So not, uh, on not all projects, uh, we get this kind of references from the set. So. We, get, uh, we got a lot of this HDRIs so we can uh, match the lighting uh, in the shots. Yes, yeah, so Scott. Um, so this is an example of, we had a shot design, we had an animatronic head, but this is actually taking place in water. And one thing you can't do is put servos and electronics in a swimming pool. It's bad for everything. <laughs> so. We had a, like a little stuffy, a little blackhead that we pushed through, knowing that this shot would be uh, animated. Also, some in this kind of setup, what I was talking about, the puppeteer can't actually see through the eyes. So we wanted to have Charlie, our creature here, look at the characters at a specific moment. And that would have mean, meant a CGI replacement anyway. But in this case, with the smoke and with everything else going on and everyone standing in a swimming pool, we decided to go full on digital with just the stuffy 
for the characters to react with. There's another shot where they actually kick the black um, object there. So here, this is a real good example. Even though it's really quick, we wanted Charlie to lock eyes with the other actors for a moment. And we could direct that in visual effects in a way that we couldn't do it with the animatronic on set. Um, underwater, you know, you can't put a 90 pound foam latex suit on an actor and put them in the water. Foam latex acts like a sponge and the next thing they would be 100 feet down on the bottom and that's bad for everyone. Um, you talk about some of the pieces you put into that. Yeah, it was uh, really challenging to, to integrate a uh, CG character with, with her. We, we had to add a lot of uh, really small, subtle shadows on her. And what you're seeing is we had a diver sort of pulling her down to get the physical nature of it, also to be a little bit of a safety uh, on our stunt double there. Uh, but unfortunately, it meant these guys had to paint our diver out. Um, Just a little but bit. But we tried to, you know, I tried to hide the stunt, the diver on the far side so that the overlap would be mostly covered by the creature on the near side. So we're thinking about that in our blocking of the scene and how we're going to fake it later. Um, this is another example yeah. for this. So close up of the stabbing again with our guy in a wetsuit holding her down. And this is a typical example of full CG shot for the show. Because definitely our real suited person could not swim in the suit. So here's me on set. On the water set. <laughs> so you are swimming, holding a camera, trying to give reference. And you're seeing basically the setup that we were just doing. I've got the cameraman underwater, we've got the diver on her, I can't see the bottom at some point, we indicate that things are rolling, um, everyone holds their breath and things start going. And then when you want to check a take, you swim over to the diver and look at the video monitor. So a little different video village than most I've been on. Um, a little more energetic because you are swimming and holding your breath and trying not to drift out to sea. Um, at least she's tied in so that they can see so swim over the raft, get your rest, and then we can all reset. Um, again, not the usual set, but it is Fiji after all, so can't complain too much. Yeah. The water was warm. Yes. <laughs> the problem with that is you get sea lice, so these little itchy creatures after a while if you spend too much time. And as you can see from my fingers, they're all pruned. So I think we're good it's, to move it's, on. It's, called, it's actually called fish spa these days. Ah. <laughs> so this is um, one of the hybrid shots where we have a guy in a, a suit which gets very hot. We have fire, we have stunts, we have pyrotechnics, and we wanted Charlie again to get a specific look and a reaction to being stabbed. So we had a little bit of time and money left, so we were able to add that kind of detail for the director by blending the technology. Again, as we went further into the show, the studio was more and more convinced at how good the match was, and we added a couple of these sweetening shots um, to sort of get the director some moments that he thought he needed as we were finishing. And you see some of the reference on set, some of the pyro. Again, foam latex about yay thick is very, very hot. They do wear chilling jackets. You see the, the little fan we have blowing in the gills to the actor's face uh, to cool them down between setups. Um, it's a big, literally a big army of people working to put all this together and take things like, I'm grabbing the reference stills of the burns. So as we burn or did makeup work on the creature on set, we'd take pictures of that evolution to send back to these guys so that wherever they were matching 
the creature in the evolution of the creature of the story, we could match both the physical and the CG. And then this is an example of a shot that we originally shot um, with the real suit, but both for some performance and how much the director loved the creature, uh, I think it was Bogdan, was like, well, can we do this all CG? I was like, as long as we don't go over budget, we're good. And I said to the director, do you mind if we replace everything? He's like, heck no, you know, let's do this. And he said exactly what he wanted and these guys were able to do it. So, um, and that's our island. Uh, <laughs> you could walk around the entire island in about 25 minutes. Uh, this is the landing side of the island. You see the little houses and we're pretty much always shooting on the far side, but um, yeah, not still, it's sunny and nice and blue and nice water, so not the worst place to be. Um, we have one uh, big shot with the island in the end, but we couldn't show it because we were spoiled. There's a little bit story. of it in the trailer. Yeah, there is a little bit in the reel. Yeah. So that's, I think, sort of the overview of what we've been doing together. Yeah. Well, we did actually a few more things, and I've I seen it in your reel. Yes. Uh, a juvenile shot. I'm sure Richie, our compositing artist, is glad that he saw that shot. Yeah, everyone loves yeah. that shot. Yeah, um, no. So I'll say, my background was effects. I started Digital Sandbox as a way of helping people with the digital technology and general filmmaking. So Juveniles was a film that I then came in on with a producer friend of mine, and I was the executive producer as well as helping mm -hmm. them do the effects, but I don't think I'm giving anything away. That was less than a million dollar US. And sort of the same thing, independent films often are finding their way as the show evolves, and they had the ending um, where somebody gets shot but they wanted a stronger ending. Mm. And so we went old school on that, which is I got the makeup effects department from that film to do a little rubber um, silicone prosthetic. And just to give you a kind of sense, um, when we did Babe, that was the first movie to use silicone prosthetics to do creatures. So now we're doing it on an indie film. We built this little rubber flap I shot it down in our backyard, basically, of the office, sent it to these guys, and Richie comped it in. But they were thrilled, because it was very cost-effective, but a big impact on the ending of their film. And I think we were telling a story about um, In Prison the other day, as I have another independent film that we worked on, and they were in Puerto Rico, and we had these guys do an explosion on a prison mm. and the director was giving a showing to people and one of the people in the audience had grown up near that prison and he was like, he's like, how did you get them to let you blow that up like that? <laughs> and the director was like, no, no, there's, it's visual effects. And he's like, no, 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 that's the real building. And it was like, no, no, you know, so my director called me all thrilled about the work that these guys did because he just thought that was the best. Yeah, that was so, the best compliment we can yeah. get. <laughs> but it, sometimes it's those little touches that make a big yeah. impact. Um, so yeah, we've done quite a few things now. Oh, we did, definitely. Anyway, um, Scott is here for questions as well as us, if you want to ask on some of our projects. Yeah, I we would just together like to, and to, to uh, say that uh, the guys prepared a little something for you because you were really brave to stay up till the end of the conference. So we will now celebrate actually the end of the first day uh, with, I will show you, Bogdan's homemade rakia. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, for... <laughs> So let's first start with the bravest one that would ask questions and then we'll, you, you, you know, you like... Have to, you only get a drink if you ask a question, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Guys at, least, at least for the beginning. <laughs> yeah, so anyone yes. has any question? <laughs> uh, 
Ra Rakia was always a big yes. motivator, yes. definitely. Uh, <laughs> a social <Richard>. lubricant. <laughs> uh, excellent presentation. <laughs> and I'm happy to make something uh, nice in Belgrade, cooperate with LA. And which uh, I'm more uh, director of uh, one training school. Uh, which uh, tools you used most in these uh, projects? Platforms or? Uh well, most of it is Maya, Houdini, Nuke for compositing, yeah. Arnold for rendering, Photoshop for matte yeah. painting. PF Tech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks again. Brilliant talk. Loved it. Um, I'm, I'm really chuffed that you used a latex creature because not enough of that happens in cinema anymore. Everybody goes straight to full CG. Um, it just took me back to all those incredible makings of that I saw growing up. I'm quite old, so I, I'm, I'm you know, seeing all those all those old movies just brought back all those memories. But I'd love to, two questions. One is, um, could you tell us more about the decision to work with a fully latex creature, and obviously a hybrid, if that makes sense. And my second question is, where is the latex suit now? Who owns it? Because um. <laughs> it's Halloween, it would come in very handy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you couldn't, um, I don't, we don't have those. I mean, the decision, Early on was the director wanted to be sort of old school, both because he wanted to and budget. Um, I'm a big believer in the physicality of it. I mean, when we did Hollow Man, I had Kevin Bacon do everything and we weren't trying to create a synthetic digital human. We were recreating Kevin Bacon and I, I've always believed the actor does something for you. And even if it's not perfect, it still gives everyone on set something to react to. Um, the suit, I assume, has rotted by now because foam latex does not last. Um, particularly foam latex you take on a beach in the stunning heat. Um, Probably quite smelly as well. Yeah, exactly. Inside, poor guy. I mean, they'd turn it out and rinse it and blow it dry it every day. I mean. They wear out. I mean, um, you know, even the latex masks we had for Kevin, yeah, they don't last. Um, I've got an old one turning into powder in the house. Um, but yeah, it's some fun, and everyone wanted to do it. It's the right solution for the budget. Um, but what was interesting is a lot of that historical knowledge had been forgotten. So when they first showed me the design, of the, it had sort of a dog, a horse leg, dog leg on the back of the, and I'm like, we can't do that. And they're like, why? I'm like, this is a heavy foam creature on a beach. Like this guy's gonna have to walk on tiptoes the whole time he's going to die. <laughs> and eventually we had little, like a metal platform slipper that he could wear Bird. upright so he could walk on the beach. Same thing. Um, like on a big budget film, we, you know, they were like, could we put the suit in the water? And they're like, yes. And then they're like, well, but we need four people around him to lift him out of the water in case he falls because he won't be able to lift himself out. And on a big budget film, you could have four people standing by. We couldn't afford four safety people. So we're like, okay, anytime he's fully in the water, it's CG. And those are just the practical natures of trade-offs between the different technology. But also, I don't, you know, if I just need some legs walking or it walking in the beach, I don't need to spend that money in post to do it. And we would shoot some safety plates in case we weren't sure in cases, but generally it's like, let's get the most we can out of the creature. And then we'll either, you know, we know these shots are all CG we know these could be enhanced and these could go either way. Thank you. Simon, you're right. yeah. <laughs> well, I had enough of that this week. <laughs> <laughs> Not this one. I, I think Bogdan deserved one as well. Later. And Scott. Later. <laughs> For answering all the questions. 
I think she's pouring some extras. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just bring it on. All of you guys. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I have a question based on uh, where it's more focused on uh, character cre uh, creature creation and modeling. Uh, well, design actually. Uh, like, uh, how do you? Uh, well, how deep do, do you go into the specifics, for example, of anatomy or, you know, the uh, in read, uh, reading and uh, then, yeah, modeling. For, for example, like uh, with, uh, with the show rail of animals, we can see the bones, uh, ten, te tendons, uh, skin, um, muscles, but uh, in the creatures that aren't familiar to us, how far do you go to, uh, for the references? For example, on, on the, uh, I, I don't know uh, what it's called, the, the fish thingy. Uh, Sweetheart, yeah. Uh, for, for, or Charlie. Charlie, 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, he has a lot of uh, the bone uh, exterior. So how do you go on imagining the, the connections and the base anatomy? It is some imagination, I mean, um, JD, our director, Neville, the designer, they kept drawing what JD wanted. Then we would feed back into that and say, hey, that sort of looks like uh, a stingray. You know, how's it going to swim when it swims? It's going to swim like a dolphin. So we need to make sure this is flexible here. And these structures, are they bony? Are they flexible cartilage? So in pre-design, we'd be talking about that as we looked at each drawing. And that doesn't mean we solved all the problems then, we just were asking questions. And then when things get into these guys' hands, then... We're going to explode. Um, That's it. <laughs> they have to solve the problem and let us know where their issues. I'll use Hollow Man um, as another issue, as another example. We took, I took my crew to a human dissection. We took them to a body and we were shown parts of it. Um, anatomy, and we had, an, we had an anatomy professor that we had as a consultant. And when we were building the human body from the inside out, there were rules about how the human spine worked. And when we built it, it did not function. It didn't work. And we couldn't get the range of motion and we made adjustments, but then we called our expert in and said, the numbers don't work. And she's like, well, those were just guesses. We, we don't get to bend live humans that much and the dead ones are dead. And so we just guessed between how much we could bend it a real one and the measurements on a dead one. So you guys are probably right. And we, he, she's just like, we've never seen that do it. So it's an evolution of um, targeted science along with the art and then reconciling the differences when you have the inevitable collisions. And because it's a movie, if we have to cheat for one shot, we cheat for one shot. And, call it a day, so. Yeah, forget about reality. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it, a lot of it is based in reality. It's, um, again, a different example, like Starship Troopers, you know, you have the ship's bank and you have them use momentum. And, and I know from a physics standpoint that that's not required in space travel, but if you do, all you need to do, it just looks wrong and the audience wants to see something. And it came up with the leeches. You know, the leeches are not, you know, there aren't toothy leeches in Lake Lacrimose, but they're based on things we've seen. And so you take those pieces and you put them together in a way that the audience reacts in a visceral way. And generally audiences react in a visceral way if you're tapping into something they've experienced or tapping into l literally a primal fear. So you're trying to put all that together. Um, like even in the design of Charlie from the front, there's a face 
in some of his structure. And you don't see it, you don't know it, but you have some reaction to it when it's on screen. And those are all the little bits and pieces that go into the thinking as the design evolves and then gets into these guys' hands to execute that idea. More, more drink? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is tired. Maybe you should try some rap. <laughs> Not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but who likes he can come here yeah. and take yeah. it. More questions? Yes. I came a long way. Yeah. 16 hour flight. So just three questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big Don't sacrifice. Go ahead. You get two. When nobody wants. Uh, what was your uh, funnest? Uh, I don't know, think part uh, of uh, in making the movie Starship Troopers because a movie is fun <laughs> by it itself. Um, I just had never done anything that big, like epic space. Um, and it was sort of old school. I came up, you know, I had a background in traditional photography, um, computer science and film school. And when I got into the business, I started working really in film at ILM. So The Abyss was my first movie. I think that's 1989. Um, but that was still when a lot of traditional stuff was in the business. So we did a lot of cross training in the company where we'd go to the model shop, we'd go to the creature shop. We'd, you know, I learned how to do motion control camera moves. So, and when I left ILM and I went freelance, I intentionally found jobs, you know, because my first jobs weren't as big as the ones I did at ILM, but when I was supervising on my own, I found jobs that would teach me something about part of the art I didn't know. So I'd be like, I could do this for you, but I wanna experience this. And Starship in many ways was the culmination of a lot of that. It's like all this CG technology, we we're mixing different size miniatures with the ships, we we're doing CG enhancements to do the destruction of the ships, we we're studying uh, a lot of Paul Verhoeven, is the directors, um, as you guys, were, you know, his experience was World War II growing up, and that had a very visceral feeling to him, as I understand it does to many of you, and he was talking about like seeing blown up buildings and how they get cleaved. So we did that research and we put that into the decks of the ship. I think we were definitely the first people to put bodies flying out of ships when they were blown up, which were CG bodies. But we were mixing, you know, one foot models with 18 foot models. All these mixed scales we were using previs, which really didn't exist before that to put these different scale models in a way that old school model making couldn't done, have done. So we were both pushing the traditional art further than it had gone before, and we were bringing a new art to it in a way. And I got to do like 50 foot explosions, which are really cool. So, you know, you take a bunch of chemicals up to the air on a crane and blow it up. And, you know, hey, who's not for blowing big stuff up. So yeah, there was a lot of um, fun, big, grueling. Um, you, know, you always say shows don't get any worse than that. And I think Starship was one of the first to say it doesn't get, I mean, my hours on Starship Troopers were, I had 7 a.m. model dailies. I would meet in the model shop, see dailies for what they shot the night before. I would go to the model shop, review from like eight, 8 to 10 or 8 to 9. I would then go over to digital and watch dailies with the digital department, and that would take a few hours there. Um, then the film would be back from the pyro shoot we did the night before, and I'd be in pyro dailies until like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So from 7 to 1 in the afternoon, I'd be just watching footage. 
<clears throat> and then you'd stop, you'd have a little lunch, you go back, you do all the rounds with the digital people. And I had roughly 700 artists working for me at the time, which, you know, when I started ILM, there were 12 of us in digital. So it was a huge change. Difference, yeah. <laughs> um, then I'd do all that and I'd finish up with that crew and I'd drive out to the pyro set and we had to wait till night to shoot the pyro. Um, I'd set up the shot with the pyro and it would be hours of rigging. So they had a trailer there that I would go in the trailer and sleep and they'd shoot like a bunch of easy shots while I was sleeping. Then they'd wake me up for the big shot at night which could be anywhere from 10 to one in the morning. We'd shoot that shot and then I'd repeat the process the next day. So I'd drive home, sleep until seven, start the whole thing. I mean, just a nonstop process with, because we probably had a couple hundred people on the model and pyro team as well. Um, anyway, we had some fun doing lots of stuff. <laughs> there you go. Hi. Uh, could you tell us about uh, what was the toughest creative decision you had to make on uh, the movie Sweetheart and your thinking process behind it? Uh, the toughest what decision? Uh, creative decision. Creative? Um, I think the toughest creative decision probably wasn't mine. Um, we were definitely, like the end scene when you're struggling with, again, the mixed technologies, I think um, for people doing something bigger than they've ever done before, that end scene, we were trying to do some of the hardest CG stuff that the film had. We were trying to do some of the hardest stunt stuff that we had with the actor in the suit. Um, the actress also was being pulled by wires and stunts and then you're doing it surrounded by a ring of fire. Um, I think trying to get each department to do their best in turns versus everyone, like it's fine if I ask you to do something 10% better than you've ever done it before. If I'm asking five departments to all do 10% better at the same time, it's sort of a recipe for disaster. So in that end scene, trying to balance all those challenges with what everyone wanted. Um, the underwater stuff was tough, but that was a little more fun. Um, just because you sort of knew it was going to be cool. So I didn't mind swimming and paddling and sort of, you know, you, you can't really see, but we're like a mile off shore. And... Um, but that, I could picture where that was gonna go. I think the end stuff was just a little dicier from both the creative and making sure it all worked and then having the safety factors worked in. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. I need one more shot of Rakia, so I need to ask something, yeah. <laughs> but I need to deserve it first. So uh, my question is how you grew from 12 to 700 in such a, I don't know how long period. Where, where did you find the people be in that time where no one really teach anyone about the digital art? Um, well, same as you guys are doing. This is not a paid plug, but uh, <laughs> Imageworks, Sony Imageworks at the time had their own training department. So much as you guys mm -hmm. are doing with your training, all the studios were doing. Um, I think one of our trainers had come from Digital Domain who ran their own training department. At ILM, as the technologies changed, you know, they had thousands of people in the other departments. As more and more went digital, we were cross-training them into digital. Uh, it was a little bit more after I left, but we would take, you know, it started, I think, with map painters. The map painters transitioned to digital, then their work started getting comped in digital. But department by department, people would get cross-trained. But pretty much every company, all the big companies had in-house training at the time. Uh, it wasn't until much later that outside training and, you know, forget the concept of online video, which just didn't exist. 
There was nothing, if you didn't do it yourselves, it wasn't happening. So what you guys are doing is pretty standard from my experience. There was somebody. Uh, Terminator 2 pushed the limits of what was possible with uh, computer graphics at the time. Was the story written about, around what's possible or uh, it was uh, like trying to, to uh, uh, make um, uh, uh, trying to push uh, the, 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 the technology that you have to, to meet the story? No, um, Jim Cameron, who wrote T2, had also done The Abyss. So it was the first script I read, and again, this is new in my career, so it was only the third movie I worked on, I think, um, where what we had done with The Abyss, Jim had written a story that was just beyond what we could do. And I read that and sort of was like, I know we can do this. I have no idea how today. But I, I sort of knew we could get there. Um, but you read it and you were like, and I've only had that experience one other time, which was Hollow Man. And when I read Hollow Man, I was like, I have no freaking idea, but I know we can do it. And it was... I mean, it was 2000, it was 20 years ago, Hollow Man, we did the R&D on that. So for a full matching Kevin, but when I read that script, I was the same feeling was like, I'm pretty sure I can do this. I have no freaking idea how we're gonna do it today. And you schedule stuff out where when you start post or when you're shooting, you do all the measurements, you do all the stuff you think you're gonna need and then you do the easy shots first, and then you do the next hardest ones, you do the harder ones after that. Sort of like we were talking with Sweetheart, where based on what these guys were delivering in the early shots, it gave the director some hope that they could do more things in his budget. In this case, I knew darn well they could do it. It was more convincing the director who was new to this to do it. Um, but yeah, T2 was exactly, I have no idea how we're going to do this, but it's going to be cool trying. And um, as I said, the rest is history. So. If you Eight guys seconds. aren't going to grab drinks, <laughs> we're going to drink them all. Again, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, Boom. I wanted to ask you just uh, how does it feel to get to win uh, an Oscar, actually? Way better than not winning. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about that experience? Um, I mean, you know, I was sort of young and naive in a way. Um, it was, I won the Oscar for Babe. So we were definitely the underdog movie. Uh, we were against Apollo 11, Apollo 13, sorry. Um, and... I think I had been sitting watching with my parents the Oscar no. a couple of years before, and they were saying something. I was like, oh, no, no, that's way off for me. You know, that's way off for me. And yeah, the next thing you know, you know, we're shooting Babe, we're doing this thing, and Chris Noonan, who was the director, I really believed in. And, you know, he, he had this idea of this movie he wanted to make. Um, you know, George Miller, Kennedy Miller, who did Mad Max, was the producer and he would brought this team together for us. But we're on set and people are like, what do you think you're doing? And you guys, many of you are probably too young, but before Babe, I have to break it to you, animals didn't talk. Um, and we were bringing this whole new concept to the world and you weren't quite sure if that creative concept was going to fly and uh, some of the work that you saw in my reel was the scene where we were trying to sell the idea to a world that had never seen animals talk animals have a scene and it was a whole so we didn't know what we were doing the sh long and short answer of it was jamie cromwell farmer hoggett were standing in a muddy field one day and he's like what do you think we're doing here and it's like well it's either like the wizard of oz 
and it'll be a seminal moment in film, or it'll be in and out of theaters so fast, we won't know what hit us. Uh, luckily for us, I think it was a little bit the opposite. But we went through the whole process, and it's, even then it was a very simpler process, but it's an ordeal. You have, you know, and again, these are high class problems. There's, you know, you're going to events and uh, more events, and, you know, you're giving presentations, and there's a whole somewhat marketing thing, and we were behind because Apollo 13 was big, and they were being a little fair about it because both Apollo 13 and Babe were both universal, so they couldn't crush us too much. Yeah. So we kept sort of staying in the game, staying in the game, and um, really it was the night before the Oscars, Rob Legato had done Apollo 13. Um, we were at a big pre-Oscar party, and he sort of said, I'm just going to say congratulations now. That goes, you guys are going to win. And I'm like, what? And the next day you're in the Oscar, you know, you go through the limo, you go through all this stuff. And my partner who was with me at, you know, the event, everyone else on my team said, we didn't really hear who won, we just saw you stand up. And as soon as they said Scott, I was up out of my seat. I like, there were no other Scots available, so it must have been, <laughs> must have been us. Um, the rest of it's a blur. You go up there, um, in our case it was Will Smith was the presenter, they hand you your thing, um, everyone talks, I barely got time to talk, and then they whisk you backstage, and this was the old Shrine Auditorium, it's a little more winding, sorry, we were at Dorothy Chandler, um, is a winding back room, so you they had told all our spouses, the people who had been there before, um, as soon as the guys leave, you guys all move next to each other because the seat sitters are going to come in and fill in, and they won't be back for a half hour. And you're like, what? And sure enough, you get backstage, and you have TV press like instantly grabbing you, and then it goes a newspaper and then radio, and like the people from Australia were getting called from their press, you're getting called from your hometown. So there's this whole process behind the scenes that you go through and somewhere along the line, you, you like you sign posters, you sign all sorts of, you just come out the other end of this machine. But again, all I remember was the, they called Scott, I stood up and you're on stage. Oscar, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> On the other case, like when we didn't win, because uh, we were also nominated for Hollow Man and Starship Troopers, what you do if you don't win is you all meet at the bar and have a few drinks, yeah. which is what we did in both those other cases. So, um, but again, I think, you know, also in the end, I think, you know, Hollow Man's one of the things I'm most pleased with that I've done in my career. Um, Paul Verhoeven called me the morning after the Oscars and said if my movie had been better, you guys would have won. Um, but it's some of the best work I've done. So you can't, you can't do it for that. And babe, we weren't doing it for that. We just didn't think we were gonna be in that league. Um, but it was about story and it was about emotional impact as much as how hard the technology was. So what I learned from that is you just have to do the projects because you wanna do them and let the chips fall where they fall, you know, but I, I won't lie, winning an Oscar changes a lot of stuff as far as having the options to work on projects that you want to work on and with people, you know, that you respect and hopefully can have fun with if they're not killing you. Yeah, it gives you opportunity to. Yeah, I, I mean, some people say it doesn't do anything and I, I won't go that far. Uh, it doesn't change everything but it does give you access to certain things and it does make repeating that process a little bit easier. So. Thank you, Scott. Oh, guys, you wanna go home now? <laughs> <laughs> no, come have a drink. <laughs>